Right now, you're listening to the Azeem Digital Asks podcast, the podcast where I, Azeem, talk to some of the top marketers in the industry, find out everything about them, how they got to where they are today, and more importantly, sharing some really useful marketing tips that will help everybody listening to this become better marketers. Stay tuned for another great episode. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Azeem Digital Asks podcast. Second episode for 2021. Time seems to be absolutely flying, but enough about that. Let me tell you about my guest today. He is not just renowned for his not new response. I've got Barry Schwartz with me today, who is the CEO of Rusty Brick, founder of Search Engine Roundtable, and has covered search for over 17 years. He's also a speaker, moderator, and coordinator of many conferences, and he's pretty much at the forefront of search. Barry, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You do a great job on this podcast, and I appreciate you having me. Awesome, man. Thank you very much for the kind words. $50 is coming your way soon. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> As always, we are going to start with like a bit of an icebreaker, warm you up for the show. The difference with yourself is that I've got two, and I want to ask you this one straight away, because I know listeners are going to be dead keen to find this out. How many times a week do you say not new? So it really depends on the week. I probably guesstimate maybe like 15 times a week, but it depends. Like <laughs> if Google's really rolling something out and a lot of people are seeing this and I covered it, I'll go and have to go ahead and like over and over again say it's not new. So I could like say it's not new like 30 times in one day. Uh, but it depends on what Google's doing. As John Mueller said, it depends. <laughs> I feel like there's a market there for merchandise, not new merchandise. Anyway, I'm not going to say that out loud because then uh, someone will steal the idea. But anyway, <laughs> we'll move on. Second one then is if you had a time machine, Barry, would you go back in time or would you go into the future? Uh, that's a good question. I probably would not. I, there was this like movie once about fast forwarding through the future and how much the person missed with his family and this and that. So I wouldn't want to fast forward through the, to the future because I don't want to miss anything that I don't know what's going to happen, I guess. So I guess I would go back in time um, as opposed to going in the future. Why? Yeah. You want to know what I would do in the, in the, in the, in the past to, and change? Yeah, or, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a very hard one. Um, like obviously root out all evil. Like would I, you know, the whole thing around, would you, you know, stop Hitler? Would you make sure COVID didn't happen by finding that bat that initially, you know, <laughs> was cooked and ate or something like that? Um, <laughs> I guess it was not cooked properly. Um, so, I mean, yeah, this is obviously – pretty historic moments in the world that if you could like wipe out and never happened and i obviously now we're living through covid um so yeah i would probably try to figure out how we could avoid that oh there's a whole side avenue i'm very tempted to go down on this question but i absolutely won't because we could spend <laughs> the whole podcast talking about it right so barry welcome to the show very excited to have you on uh for those who don't know about you don't know who you are would you mind sharing a little bit more about yourself telling us a bit about yourself yeah sure um so seo is not my career per se i write about it it's a hobby um what my career is is i own a company called rusty brick that's where i make my money it's a software development company um in new york um but i love and really love it's like seo is like a passion for me it's a hobby uh, we don't provide really SEO services for our customers. We build software for our customers. Um, but we've been doing web development since the early 90s um, and a lot of mobile development. Um, but I started probably in the SEO space in early 2000s, like 2001, 2002, and started writing about SEO in like December 2003, I believe. Um, mostly just to keep notes about what the industry is talking about, what, what's changing in the industry. And once I started that, I, you know, I kind of got hooked. I just love to track what is changing in the space. You must have seen a huge amount of change then, which uh, I will definitely pick your brains about later on. I wanted to ask you, Barry, did you ever have like a, a light bulb moment or did you ever have that moment where you thought, do you know what, I'm this isn't going to be the career for me? What was that moment for you? When did it all start? Um, it started in December of, no, I'm just joking. I don't know the exact um, <laughs> did I have an aha moment that this is the career for me? So like SEO is not the career for me. It's like, like it's the hobby for me. Um, when did I know SEO was that for me? I don't even know. I'm not even sure. Um, I don't think there was a specific date. Um, I guess maybe when I was interviewed by 
you know, certain personalities like big time news, like Brian Williams before he was, you know, he went through a scandal um, on NBC and maybe on the CBS shows and different things. But those were like big moments where like real media was interviewing me, asking me my opinion about Google. That was pretty cool. Um, but I mean, there's different like career points, like on the Rusty Brick side, my personal life, the SEO hobby side. So it's hard to pinpoint each one. There's obviously different historic moments in my life, I guess, that I could say, all right, this was a big deal for me. This was a small, you know, not a big deal. Um, but it's just, you know, you know, really grinding out each day, doing the day-to-day stuff. I'm very into routine. I'm very into having a certain um, continuous and ongoing routine every single day so that, you know, you could be, you can expect, you know, people could expect what they expect from me every single day. So that, you know, being consistent is very important. To me. Yeah. Completely agree with that. Fully on board with that consistent approach. Love that. Excellent answer. I am going to jump back to the time machine question slash analogy. Imagine you do have one and you can go back to when you very first started out or when you very first took those first steps in the industry, but this time you're armed with all the knowledge that you've got right now. What advice do you think that you give to yourself in the beginning? Um, so I don't know if I'd change much. I'm very, I'm very, very privileged to be what I am now. I'm very, very privileged, privileged in terms of, you know, my outreach and my connections I have, my network, uh, money and everything like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm good there. But I guess if I had to look back and say, where can I, you know, exploit things as thinking like an SEO mind, where can I exploit things? You know, early SEO days, early Google days, it was super easy to take advantage of the search engine. So would I build build more affiliate sites um, to make really quick money in a cheap way and totally dominate the search results based on what I knew back then and take more advantage of it. Would I do that? I don't know. Um, you know, I built some sites back in the day that, you know, drove a tremendous amount of affiliate traffic, um, made some affiliate income. I probably should have taken more advantage of that. Um, I did it mostly out of trying to research what's going on and how easy it is to manipulate Google. Uh, would I build maybe like more tool sets in the industry? Well, obviously, Moz, you know, I know Rand Fishkin in the early days. We, I lit, launched a small little SEO keyword tracker tool using the original Google search API. Um, he did also, Sean Hogan um, from Digital Point also released one after me. Um, and he took that into another level and built really amazing SEO tools. Um, I did not do that. I built, I, did, I built tools in other spaces outside of the SEO field. Um, so should I have done that? I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, would I have changed anything with the way I write? I don't think so. I don't think my SEO writing or coverage of the industry would have changed at all. Um, but I guess, you know, being opportunistic, maybe I would have probably maybe done more affiliate stuff in the earlier days when it was very, very easy. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks very much for sharing that. I wanted to ask you then, so you mentioned earlier on about having like light bulb moments uh, throughout various points, like for SEO and for the company and everything else. What are some of the things that you've learned from those and what were some of those moments that you can share with the listeners? So I guess um, what I've learned from consistently doing what I do on a day-to-day basis and is being out, I'm very out there. Um, People read what I write. Uh, I do a lot of videos. It really taught me to have very thick skin, Um, like really thick skin. You could like literally threaten me, like threaten my family, you know, my, our lives or whatever. And I'll, it'll just roll right off me. It won't affect me at all. Um, and I often see how on the internet, especially on Twitter, people could say stuff that really upsets people. Um, and sometimes I don't understand it. I'm like, this, this troll on the internet says something to bother you or said something about politics that upset you. It doesn't, it's not important. You know, what people say on the internet is they would never say that to your face. I mean, most people would never say stuff like that to your face. Yeah. Um, and in my opinion, it's so easy to shoot off a tweet or add a comment to a blog post or whatever uh, on YouTube. Um, but when you're speaking to somebody face to face, they're not these days, obviously, because uh, of COVID. But if you were <laughs> speaking to people face to face in a safe way, maybe over Zoom or on a podcast like this, you would never say the things you would say, you know, on Twitter or comment, blog comments or YouTube comments to people. Um, and I truly believe people are good in, generally and good in nature. Um, and I give people often the benefit of the doubt that when they say something nasty to me, they're either having a really bad day or they're trying to make a funny joke that's not really funny, maybe. Um, but it doesn't hurt me. It doesn't bother me at all. Like, And maybe that's bad. Maybe I have no emotional sense left in me where – what people people could say things to me and I have zero reaction to it, either positive or negative. Um, it kind of made me all numb to the reaction of the internet or the people on the internet. 
um, which may have be a bad thing, but generally you, to, to, to have, I'm sure you, your podcast is becoming really popular. I assume at some point um, you already heard from people negative comments about certain things. Um, and hopefully you just let that slide off your, you know, slide it off your back without affecting you because you're doing an amazing job. Um, what you do is uh, you're probably not getting paid for it. Um, and you're doing this really to help the community and to help the industry overall. And that's the important goal here is not, you know, about hurting the industry or hurting you. It's about what you're doing to help the industry. And as long as you keep with that sense, don't worry about what anybody else says because they would never say that to your face because what you're doing and what anybody does when they share anything online for free is really to kind of help the industry. And that's a very, very important thing. And we can't, we have to promote people when it, come, when it comes to that. Yeah, love that. That's a brilliant answer. And uh, thank you very much for the kind words. Yeah, I mean, there have been a handful of comments, but like you said, they're just uh, water off a duck's back. And again, yeah, it's all it's all for free. I've never looked for any sort of financial compensation for this. But yeah, look, uh, I'm going to stop talking because this episode is about you. I do want to <laughs> sidestep for a minute, though. I asked Rand this question before, um, and I think your previous answers led me quite nicely to this. How do you get to that point where people can say things to you, people control you and just, you know, probably say some really mean things? How do you get to that point where you just don't let it affect you? Because you see on Twitter all the time, SEO Twitter, for example, is famous uh, for sometimes having, you know, quite heated debates. How do you get to that point where you just don't let things affect you? I don't know. I mean, I I, I kind of talked about it like briefly. I, I just give people the benefit of the doubt. What they're saying, I don't always believe they mean. I think they're just having a really bad day. I mean, people used to blame me all the time when Google did an update and their business was shattered. They needed an outlet. They needed somebody to blame. And since I was often the person who was the first to post the news about it, they're going to go ahead and shoot the messenger, literally. Um, so, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with being, you know, I'm okay with it because it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't hurt me in any which way. So let them go after me who has no, it doesn't bother me emotionally in any way. So why they should go after me because it's not going to impact me in any way versus going after somebody who might be more sensitive to those issues um, where it could actually damage them. Like, you know, people, you know, I'm thankfully in, you know, mental illness is a big, big issue. And I know Rand probably spoke to you. I'm, I didn't listen. I did. I'm sorry for not listening to Rand's uh, <laughs> podcast. Um, I listened to part of it, but I, I, he's very open about mental uh, issues that he's had mental uh, illnesses and stuff like that and so forth and depression and anxiety. Uh, and thank God I haven't really had, you know, much of that at all. And um, I'd rather people go after me and, because I'm not going to have an adverse reaction to that than somebody who may have an adverse reaction to that. Um, I don't think there was any specific thing that led to that. Um, as a kid, probably, uh, I was very, very, probably more sensitive um, about what people thought. And then I guess I just matured and I really couldn't care less what other people think. Um, obviously, if I'm very open to admitting I'm wrong, I'm, I, I write a lot and I will occasionally write something that's incorrect. And I will then very publicly say, hey, I wrote this, it was incorrect, and this is, you know, thank you for, you know, somebody, whoever clarified, whoever told me it was incorrect, I will publicly thank them and so forth. But yeah. I don't take that personally. It's professional, I guess, and I have to make the you know, right, what's right. But if somebody blames me for something, like I'm too much of a, like, it's funny, I, people blame me for being too much of a Google fanboy, and then Googlers, like, yell at me for being too much of anti-Google. Um, <laughs> so why you write such a nasty article about Google doing this when we didn't mean to do it? It goes both ways and you can't make everybody happy. Um, at the same time, I try not to write much. I don't I have, I have no real opinion on stuff. So when I write stuff, I'm like X, Y, and Z happened. This is maybe why you should care about it. The end. I'm not going to go off on a rant about why we should hate Google because of it or love Google because of it. You know, you can decide what you want to do with that. Um, Rand is much more of an emotional um, writer um, and speaker, which has led obviously to Rand's success. I mean, he's very popular on stage. He's very popular, um, and that's his his technique. That's what he's good at: is showing emotion um, and reason and rationale around stuff. I'm more of like black and white. This is what's happening. You know, I have no opinion about it, and that's it. I always hated when I, in my world, we, we in the Jewish world. Um, we go to not anymore because of COVID, but you go to you go to synagogue and the rabbi speaks for you know twenty minutes um, about you know some topic, and I always like why can't that rabbi or I guess in whatever religion you whoever speaking to your preacher say that in like 
half the time or a quarter of the time. They just repeat the same thing just to nail it in. I'm like, say what you need to say and you can move on to other things as opposed to repeating the same thing over and over again in different ways so people can understand it. So I'm more of a black or white type of guy, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Allowing people to come to their own conclusions uh, is a great way to approach stuff. It does obviously sometimes lead to negative comments, which you've spoken about there. So we won't sort of carry on on that. I wanted to sort of ask you then about in terms of inspiration. So where do you draw your inspiration from? Or more specifically, who do you draw your inspiration from? Who inspires you in the industry? Um, I don't call it inspires, but, um, you know, somebody I've looked up to since day one in the industry is Danny Sullivan. Obviously, I've worked with him for a really, really long time. Um, back in, when he was at Search Engine Watch, I was, with, I was working with him there. Um, then at Search Engine Land, XMX, all those events. And then when he left me and stabbed me in the back, went to Google, the evil company. I'm just joking. <laughs> but when he went over there, it was kind of like, yeah, he was burning out on. He he obviously first announced that he's no longer running at Search Engine Land. He's retiring from that space. He's burned out on it. And okay, I respect that. Uh, and then he announced months and months later, he didn't he didn't have any plans to go to Google. And I believe him when he said that um, that he was going to Google. So yeah, so. Um, that was shocking, but I think it's a good thing. So, but I think Danny is somebody that in terms of his writing skills and his understanding of how everything works in search, he was able to really quickly and lengthily give you a very quick in the first paragraph, tell you exactly what's going on and then really, really well convey all the things you really needed to know about that topic. And his writing skills and way of communicating that is something that I've always looked up to. Um, you know, in the in this field of writing about SEO, um, so he's one person I would definitely point out. There's so many other people, I, you know, in, in the industry. I don't want to, you know, Matt Cutts is somebody I've always felt was a good person, even though people um, in the industry have have reservations about him because he worked for Google and he wrote algorithms and his team wrote algorithms that prevented spam and hurt a lot of, you know, businesses technically, but other businesses, you know, were, succeeded because of that. Uh, and there's a lot of newcomers in, in our industry that are really making a push on diversity, um, really making a push on understanding different areas of, of SEO, from technical SEO to accessibility to so many things in, in, in the space. So it's just amazing to see all these newcomers come in um, and make such a difference in the space. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Great answer. Thanks very much for sharing. I wanted to ask you a little bit then about current role and everything that's going on right now. What sort of challenges are you facing and how are you getting past them? Um, so I'm not really facing any specific challenges. I guess, you know, time is a challenge that everybody has. I mean, there's only so much time in a day um, yeah. and there's so much to do, um, so much to write, so much to do with your business, so much to do with your family. And there's just not enough time in the day. So it's just how I handle that and overcome it is just sleep less and work faster. Um, I'm, like, I'm an extreme, I'm OCD about making things as efficient as possible. So if I could, like one thing, it's, it's stupid, but I keep my cell phone, not in my back pocket or my, my pants pockets, but I keep it in my shirt pocket. I make sure to get just pockets on my shirts so that it's one less slow move to reach down into my pocket and my pants would take longer than me for me to reach into my pocket and my shirt pocket and show me what's on the screen. So stupid little things, I look to optimize every little piece of my day so that it takes even a fraction of a second less so that I have a little bit more time to do more work, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Normally, I'd be like, oh, you know what, that, that's quite strange, but I've been uh, reading a book that's called Atomic Habits, which is about essentially getting 1% better every day. And what you've just said there literally is exactly what's in the book, pretty much about how you can optimize and make things better and faster. Which is right. Great. And honestly, it kind of makes sense for me because what my company does is really about making businesses um, and, and workflows much more efficient through technology. So like one example, I mean, when I used to bill my clients, it literally used to take me a full day to do billing. Now it takes me about 20 minutes just to make sure there's, make sure there's no mistakes based on our flags and then press a button and everything gets sent out automatically. Um, so it's all about making things more efficient for me, at least. Awesome. Uh, being in-house, that's one thing I absolutely do not miss is the billing side of marketing. So we'll move swiftly on. Essentially, this podcast started as a lockdown podcast, and I'm still going to ask the question because uh, COVID is not over yet, unfortunately. Hopefully it will be soon. But in terms of uh, the effects of COVID on you professionally, what were the effects on you and your business? Uh, how did you come back from that? How have you responded to COVID professionally? So initially, I, I remember like in March, early March, I remember, you know, people getting concerned about it and what we're going to do and we're Google closing their offices. And I'm like, all right, nobody has to come to the office anymore. 
if you want to, fine, come, but don't come if you don't want to. And then like two days later, I'm like, you know what? Nobody, nobody's coming to the office. Everybody work remote. It wasn't a big deal for us because we all had remote access anyway. So if anybody needed to work from home, you know, our 20 plus employees were able to easily just go remote and work from home whenever they need to. Um, but in terms of, it wasn't like, like they always work from home. So they had to like go ahead and figure out their space. So eventually they all went back to the office, took their monitors, took their computers and slowly made their homes the space that they needed it to be. Um, so my main challenge as being an uh, owner of a business was making sure getting our employees properly set up, making sure they feel safe, making sure they, they feel secure with their job. Like they were all nervous, like, are we going to have a job? Are you going to have to cut my salaries and stuff like that? And thankfully, um, the, at least for 2020, we did okay. We didn't have to make any changes to payroll or staff or any reductions there. So that was always on my head about, you know, are we going to be able to, are our clients going to pay? Are they going to have business and so forth? And then employees always want to be productive. They want to feel like they're getting stuff done. Um, so giving, making sure they have that sense of communication, doing like every few weeks a video call with the whole team, making sure everybody's utilizing Slack well and stuff like that. Um, so I think, and then everybody has the same challenges, like working from home with kids. You know, it's hard. Um, so, you know, even for me, I never, I always spent most of my day in the office. I usually got to the office at 6 a.m., um, left around 7 p.m., you know, got home. Wow. I didn't have a desk at home. I just worked from my bed. I had like a little hospital tray where I used to work from home, but I, <laughs> I spent most of my day in the office. Um, so I had to set up a space in the, in here where, where kids are around to make sure I could quietly talk to people like you um, <laughs> without them having to like running in. Um, and yeah, I think that's been the challenge for everybody in terms of how they can adapt to working from home unless they already work from home. Yeah. Um, I have to say, 6 a.m. till 7 p.m. That is a very long day. And then carrying on when you go home as well. Wow. Yeah, wow. it actually started before I worked from, I worked about an hour from home before I left to work. And then I work all night. Um, I'm addicted and it's not healthy, but it's, I think it's healthy for, I hate when people say don't promote how much you work. It's not healthy for, I think it's healthy for some people and I think it's not healthy for other people. So I don't think, I don't like when people say, oh, don't, I mean, people shouldn't flaunt it. I'm not flying. I'm just yeah. telling you facts. That's what I do. Uh, but to say it's not healthy for everybody, it's like saying, you know, I don't know, something is not, a, you know, a specific trait is not help, healthy for everybody. Some people have hobbies and I love working. I love, you know, I love what I do. So um, I, I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Flaunting it, absolutely not. Uh, it's one of the main reasons why I'm not a, a big fan of LinkedIn because uh, it's literally hustle porn. Like you know, wake up at four a.m., exercise for three minutes, meditate for seven, start your day. Ugh, just vacuous bores me. But I'll move swiftly on anyway. I'm very interested to hear your answer to this question because uh, you're someone who myself and the industry sees as pretty much the forefront of sort of search news. You keep on top of everything. And you're always there, ready to report on the latest goings on. How do you do that? How are you continuing to stay on top of that? What's your process? So, right. So I, there's a lot of things. One is I keep my ear to the ground a lot when it comes to what's going on in the search space. Um, obviously, that means early, early in like the 2000s, it was just being part of the SEO forums, the search marketing forums, Webmaster World, back in the old days, SEO chat, create a site forums. Some of those are no longer around. Um, and just really being involved and tracking what's going on in those forums. And just randomly you know, have a routine of like, between this hour and this hour, just check the forums. Um, social media, the same type of thing. I follow certain people closely. I follow certain people not as closely. I follow certain trends on social media, mostly on Twitter. And I just keep my eye on that using various tools, mostly around for Twitter, it's TweetDeck. Um, for forums, I have tons of different bookmarks and RSS feeds that I use. And then I have RSS feeds for the most popular, for no, tons and tons of blogs, actually. When Google Reader was around, Google Reader said, I emailed me and said, I'm the number one user in terms of consumed um, RSS feeds in their platform. Uh, I guess, I, whatever that means. I guess I read the most amount of RSS feeds out of anybody when they were around. Um, I use Feedly wow. now. Um, Feedly did not send me any anything about that. Uh, <laughs> I'm not really looking, but um, I try to cut down a lot of the RSS feeds that I'm looking at. And um, But now I, I prefer RSS to emails. Like, People are very big into email, email and newsletters and stuff like that. I, I can't stand them. I would prefer to sign up for an RSS feed um, instead of getting pushed emails. I hate having my inbox full. I'm like OCD about that too. I can't have things in my inbox that I haven't responded to. So 
Um, it's just really staying on top of stuff as much as possible and making sure you have a routine to do that. Um, like I said, it's consistency is very important to me. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Some of that stuff definitely resonates with me. I went through a point of subscribing to every email under the sun and then just setting up rules to put it into a different folder. Never read it. Then I got Feedly, made excessive use of the, the read later or save for later button, but later never came. So I was always behind. And then I did manage to sort of keep on top of stuff and set aside time to keep up. Nowhere near the levels that you're running, of course, but yeah, enough for me to sort of keep on top of that. Awesome. Thanks very much for sharing. So this is the point of the podcast where I will ask you some questions that have come in from the audience, and I'm quite interested to hear what you have to say about this. So essentially, this is a question from Heba said, and I'm sorry if I've uh, butchered your name there, but essentially, well, part of the question, she gives you a compliment. She basically says, you're famous with your not new answer to any of our questions. It just basically says, how do you manage to cover everything that relates to search engine and SERP, especially Google, and never forget anything? How do you do that? Okay, so I'm actually a machine. Um, I'm a robot. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, definitely not a robot. Um, but I, I don't know if I, I probably miss things a lot. Um, I probably mess up a lot. Um but I do so much of it that people probably miss a lot of the mistakes. Um, I, mean, I just get it. It's about being consistent. I, I wake up a certain time. I go through the, the certain routine that I do. And I try to find everything that I possibly can through different RSS feeds and t- social media and forums. Um, and of course, people know to send me stuff too. I mean, since I have a reputation of covering stuff, people ask me, you know, have you seen this before? Have you seen that before? Um, and so people, people do def- definitely feed me information as well. And that I try to always, when people send me the information, I always try to give them credit, um, in a very public way saying this person found this and this person found that, um, because they deserve the credit, not me. I'm just regurgitating what they're saying. Um, so <laughs> I'm not doing anything more than regurgitating what the industry is saying. Um, and it's yeah. not, I don't really take credit for it. I just type very fast and hit publish very fast. Um, it's really the industry itself is really on top of stuff. Um, I just know where to look and people know where to send those inf- that information to me, uh, either an email or Twitter. And I'm able to easily just say, Hey, this person found this and that person found this, or Google's doing an update or we see we potentially Google's doing an update. So, uh, I just, yeah, I just re- really try to highlight what the community is talking about and give credit to where credit's due by linking because linking, even though <laughs> the industry is all about linking, it, it's also about, showing respect to those who found what they found and giving them credit yeah absolutely and i couldn't agree more brilliant answer thank you very much for sharing that i just wanted to to come back so you mentioned about making mistakes and getting it wrong so i wanted to ask you about failure specifically um, and in the last 12 months what would you say has been the biggest failure for you and why do you think that it happened so i yeah i thought about that quite i don't really have a specific failure it's not like i um so like the may 2020 core update search engine roundtable got hit hard by that but we recovered in december 2020 i didn't do anything to change anything because i specifically wanted to see do nothing will that change anything because google says don't do nothing don't don't don't, you didn't do anything wrong you shouldn't have to do anything but don't do nothing you should really try to improve your website so yeah i continued my what i did i didn't do anything different in terms of how i do things um and it recovered so i don't know if that's a failure that i specifically did or success that actually I had, but it was something that just happened. Um, and a lot of businesses, I always find it useful to go through getting hit by a penalty because I write about getting hit by penalty or algorithm updates. I write about those things over time. And yeah. being in those shoes, I got hit by a panda update previously. I got hit by spam penalties um, for better or for worse. And it's great to be in the, to be in those shoes. Um, I mean, I guess a failure is not selling my stocks before COVID hit, you know, uh, but then they went all back up anyway. But I, the crazy thing is, I was the type of person that was buying gloves and hand sanitizer in January when China was getting nailed, I guess a year ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't think to like sell my stocks, which is, I guess, good in hindsight because everything is back up to where it was. But will it drop again? Who knows? Um, but yeah, I don't think there's any specific failure um, that I could really like mention per se. Unless you have some ideas of you want to point out any of my failures. No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an interesting way you look at you know getting hit by an update and coming back from it which i'm sure the listeners will take value from i'm quite keen to ask you then uh, what is in your digital in tray or your inbox what are you working on right now that you can share with the listeners um so i'm con- i mean when it comes to seo i'm constantly working on new stories every day i publish probably between five to ten new stories per day uh, on google on search on ppc or whatever 
Um, so I'm constantly working on that stuff. So nothing's really specific. Um, my goal this year is to uh, come out with a new search engine roundtable design, get all of that cruft and old stuff off the site, authorship, all the old legacy markups that were pre-markups before Google called it structured data, get all that code off and trying to do a complete revamp of the front end of the search engine roundtable. Um, keep improving my YouTube channel, which I kind of neglected. And I did a, I produced a video every week, but it was kind of bland. So I'm trying to make that much more entertaining. Um, and then we're constantly working on software projects for clients as well as some internally. Um, I can't really discuss our client projects too much, although we yeah, built a cool, you know, a bunch of cool projects that we should probably publish on our Rusty Brick site at some point, but I need to get client approval and all that stuff. So um, yeah, um, things just continue things and make things better over time. Awesome. Uh, well, sadly, we are coming to the end of the podcast, but I always like to ask these last couple of questions because I think the answers are quite varied across the board. And I'll forgive you for not listening to some of the other ones because you're absolutely going to after this, aren't you? Thanks very much. Anyway, moving on. If we were to swap roles, what question would you ask yourself that I haven't? Essentially, it's an open forum for you to discuss something that you haven't discussed already. So I would ask, um, what do you love most about this industry, the search industry? Oh, go on then. The floor is yours. I'm asking you. Uh, what okay. do I love most? <laughs> I'm just joking. You know, I, 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 yeah, I figured you'd ask me that question. Um, it's really the sharing, how our community shares so much with each other. It's something that I find amazing. It's competitors who are fighting over the same clients still share um, deep you know, insights with each other uh, over at conferences back in the day over beers. Um, and of course, you know, now over Zoom meetings, over Slack groups, over Twitter, some of that's public, some of it's private, but they're constantly sharing. And I, I love the, how much the industry shares with each other. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And then just a quick one from me, plus one on that. Wanted to ask you before I let you go then, in terms of your productivity, especially as someone who, you know, does super long days, 6 a.m., 7 p.m., the short version of the question is, how do you get into that productive zone? The longer version is, for example, if you listen to music, do you have a go-to song, playlist, artist? Essentially, what makes you get more productive? The thing that makes me get more productive is, again, the consistency, having a routine, making sure to stick to that. So wake up, check the emails, um, you know, go through the RSS feeds, go through the forum for certain blocks of time where I do certain things, do the client meetings at certain times. Um, handle the billing aspects at certain times of the day. Um, so just having that consistency helps stay focused on what you need to do um, and being OCD about having inbox almost zero and stuff like that, making sure not to like leave things late for later, just do them when they get them done as soon as possible. So I, I like I, when I have big projects that I need to do over time, it stresses me out that it's not done. I know it's going to take a month or two to finish that project. But if it's on my to-do list, it just I just feel like I want to get it done sooner and not have it not have it when I wake up in the morning. I'm kind of the person that will get things done that day, that even if they have to get done in two months from now. The person who makes the presentation on day one when they get the pre the, the job to do the to do the presentation, as opposed to doing it when the, the, the due date is available. Um, and no, I do not listen to music when I work. I find it to be distracting, to be actually, actually honest. And honest. <laughs> right, I'm not going to let you go. I am dead interested to find out more about this in terms of your OCD and consistency. Hypothetical situation, right? You've got your normal morning routine, but let's say you're about to jump in the car uh, and go to the office, but your car doesn't start. So now your routine is off. What do you do then? How do you respond? If something throws you off your routine, how do you come back from that? Um... Good question. Um, I'll get a little agitated. Um, like if there's traffic and stuff that I didn't anticipate. Like my kids are like, why do you use Waze or Google Maps to go from point A to point B when you know how to get there? I'm like, I want to see if there's traffic <laughs> so I don't get stuck in traffic. <laughs> um, if my, you know, my, I got a flat on the way home from someplace, it's annoying and so forth. Um, sometimes when that happens, I will literally pull out my computer and if I'm like, I can't do anything. I will pull out my computer and work from my, my you know, tethered internet connection off my iPhone. There's plenty of times where I actually pulled off the road when something has to, had to get done and just pull out my computer and just work from the corner of the street or something or pull off into a gas station or something like that. Um, so I try to find product, uh, ways to be productive while you can't be productive. Sometimes there's nothing you can do and it just be, not being productive makes me angry. Uh, or not angry, but I feel like I'm wasting time. I don't like to waste time because again, 
there's almost so much time we have on this planet yeah absolutely unplanned but i had to ask you that i was dead dead interested to to find out more about how you sort of come back from that but a brilliant answer um, and a brilliant guest barry thanks very much for taking the time out of your presumably very busy schedule to come and join me on the show sharing some really useful stuff that i think the listeners will take a lot of value from if people wanted to find out more about you, get in touch with you, or contact you. How would they do that? Uh, sure. Um, so first, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure uh, being here. You've had some amazing guests and you do an amazing job, so keep up the great work. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Rusty Brick. Um, I'm trying to promote my YouTube channel more, so youtube.com slash Rusty Brick. Make sure to subscribe, hit that bell, smash that like button, or whatever they say as YouTubers. Um, <laughs> and you can learn more about me at rustybrick.com slash, I guess, Barry. Um, but thank you so much again for having me i appreciate it awesome you are more than welcome and i'll be sure to link to those in the show notes Uh, as always the very last word on your episode goes to you so thanks very much for being a great guest and the final word on the show is all yours take it away sure so one of my biggest pieces of advice to seos that are really trying to make a difference and trying to like make something amazing and i know john says make something amazing john Mueller is like his thing is to make something amazing my thing is Make something and build something that you're so proud of and that your users love so much that if Google doesn't rank it for the keywords that are relevant to that page, some Google engineer that built that search engine or parts of that search engine will look at it and be like, what did our algorithm do wrong? What do we have to fix in our algorithm to make sure you, this site, the site that you you are listening to right now, you, you, your website, um, why, make sure that website actually ranks because something's wrong with Google if that site doesn't rank. So that's my always my biggest advice is I know it's harder easier said than done, but um, you should be really really passionate about the project you're working on that it should be embarrassing for Google to not rank it well for its keywords. So that was another great episode in the bag. I'm really enjoying hearing from some brilliant people in this industry. If you enjoyed this podcast, please follow me on Spotify. Please leave a rating on Apple Podcasts or whichever platform you are using. Tell a friend to tell a friend and hopefully see you for the next episode.